What is your view? Are we likely to get a phase one deal by the end of this year? Uh, I think both sides feel they need one because it's affecting their economies and their political systems right now. It's getting pretty stressful and they'd like to bring the boil down. The wild card is the President of the United States because I think he has a calculation. He may want to keep this trade war going through the election to show how tough and strong he is, but then he's worried about the, what it will do to the American economy and the stock market. He's stuck between those two parameters. And we, on any given day, you're not sure what he's going to do. But the rational people in, gov in both governments would like to see some kind of a deal that both of them can say, okay, now, we're, now we've taken the boil off. Let's have a longer negotiation on these difficult issues. Let's bring this back to professional, rational discussion. That is what everybody is hoping for, and that's what the people at this conference are hoping for. At the same time, they're also worried about decoupling. Does the Hong Kong bill, if it's signed by President Trump, does that threaten to derail the trade negotiations? I don't think it will derail them, but China will have to make some noise about it and be unhappy. But I, I don't think so, because uh, they don't want to put more pressure on. China's been on, a, on a, actually been on a tear of trying to be the nice guy in the negotiations. They've been opening up different sectors of, of their economy. They've been doing reforms. We're not sure whether to believe them yet, but China's been on, on paper and rhetorically has been talking about opening up more and, and pointing to more openings that are coming. So they're trying, to, they're trying to be the good guys and move this ahead. This Hong Kong thing happens... Uh, I think they'll have to make some noise, but I don't think it being... It, it, no, it, no material retaliation, because that's what they threatened. Significant countermeasures is what they said. Well, let's see. But, you know, the, the thing is, it's not a very well-thought-through bill, because it, what it does is it puts a hammer over Hong Kong that if the U.S. actually does it, they really hurt Hong Kong. Does the U.S. want to hurt Hong Kong more? I don't think so. Mm. You've talked about the fact that there's now a debate within China as to who lost America. How much pressure does that put on President Xi? I think it puts a lot of pressure on them um, because, look, the, the, the relationship with America is very important for China. They kind of had us where they wanted us. You know, China could steal technology from a big American company. They would go to the USTR and complain, and then they'd say to the USTR, but don't do anything. I don't want you to mess up my market share in China. I mean, there was this... It was bound to come to an end, but that's the way it was. And then they overreach, and they, they actually pushed the American business community um, into a corner, and they... I watched them turn against China. We heard from Kissinger yesterday talking about how if this relationship between the US and China isn't resolved, if there isn't some political dialogue after a trade deal is signed, which of course he hopes for, then you could get to the point where you end up in a hot war scenario between these two great military and economic powers that would be more devastating than World War I. Is that too far off for companies to have to factor in? Are they starting to have to factor in the risks that you do get a major decoupling and the antagonism ratchets up whoever's in the White House? I think that is too far. Yeah, that is a far, far, far off possibility. Um, look, if you look at the people-to-people -people exchanges, the, you, know, the, you can hardly get in a taxi cab in Wuhan and he doesn't have a cousin in Chicago. I mean, ties between these two countries are very deep. The DNA of our political system that is so different is what is coming to the fore now. But there's so many other ties, and there's a lot of business ties and money ties that I think bring some sanity to that. Um, as far as military, we could end up in, a, in, a, in some kind of a proxy battle at, at some point in the South China Sea, but then I don't see these two countries going head-to-head -head in any way. What Kissinger actually said is we're at the, we could be at the foothills of a Cold War, and that got taken into a hot war, but he was, I think he was more talking about that as being a, a far distant possibility. We're okay. not, we're so far from what, that. What are your clients saying to you? Are they still investing in China? Oh my God, yes. The, the, you know, the people that are moving out are toys, textiles, shoes, electronics, manufacturing for the world, because it got so expensive here, they had to leave, but they've been holding on and eating margin because this place is so efficient. Most big companies are in China for China, mm. and they're doubling down. Because this is going to be the country that leads in Internet of Things, 5G, uh, robotics, self-driving cars. And so they are coming in, they're buying Chinese companies, they're investing more, because they know they got to be in this market. This market's still got several decades of growth, another half billion people to meet the middle class. They've got to be here. If you're going to be a, a global company, you've got to be here. So, yeah, they're doubling down here. It doesn't mean they won't be doing business outside. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's some kind of a, a bifurcation of, uh, or decoupling, they'll deal with it. They'll do business in both places. Now, the difference in technology standards, we all don't know what that could lead to. But um, 
businessmen are very practical. They got to go where they so market. So despite the is. trade tensions, despite the slowing economy as well, it's still an attractive market. And Chinese officials here are enacting changes, right, to yeah. try and attract that FDI. That is happening. They've never been so nice. Huh. I've had Chinese officials say, "American business, we'd never be where we are with without you. You've been so helpful." That isn't the rhetoric I've heard the last 30 years. And it's part of that trying to win over the corporate, the U.S. corporate lobby to help to help in their defense against what's yeah, happening. Yeah, they from, need. From the I mean, they need. They need foreign investment here now. Yeah. They need capital. They need. They, none of those needs have changed. I mean, China's very strong, but it, it's not independently strong. It needs the world to work with it. And America is the most powerful country and got the best technology, so they can't alienate American business. Mm. Finally, just on Hong Kong, how does Beijing resolve this? Do they just sit this out and help that the Hong Kong authorities can round up the protesters, can grind them down? Or is there some other strategy that Beijing may deploy? Well, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I believe that they're going to have to have a very tight controls in Hong Kong beyond what they have in the mainland because they are scared of those citizens because they are not their citizens and they don't think like the mainlanders. They haven't grown up under this system mm. and it, they've showed a lot of dissatisfaction. So I think on one hand they're going to try to fix their economic problems that they've ignored for 20 years. You know, they're going to try to help people with housing and that kind of a thing. At the same time, there's going to be deep surveillance and watching people. And, and, that's, and, that's quite a terrifying prospect. It will point, be for a lot control. of people living in Hong Kong. But that is, what do you do? It, 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 that's what China knows, they know control.